So apparently, according to Hoxie, and I have reason to believe he was right about this based on what I've been able to find out, um, Dr. Harris offered Hoxie a contract. There would be a five-year testing period. Hoxie would disclose his formulas, close his own operation down. His, Fishbein and Harris and whoever else they decided to have join them would actually be the um, owners of the, of the formulas. After 10 years, if it worked, Hoxie would get 10% of the profits. That's a bad idea, I think. And Oxy refused. Harris threatened him and said, if you don't do this, then um, Fishbein and I will go after you for the rest of your life. Uh, later, Harris and Fishbein denied all of this and reported that they always thought he was a quack. They didn't have any interest in this, but um, uh, it, it, too much to go into now. But, but this has been reported that Fishbein in particular um, was a greedy guy. I'm gonna show you that in a couple minutes here. He really went after a lot of good cancer treatments and tried to own them and, um, and, and nobody wanted to do business with him. So I have a tendency to think that this was accurate. Well, Fishbein was editor of the Journal of the American Medical Association, as I mentioned, it, a big source of income for the American Medical Association. He had a lot of power and Hoxie had made a very powerful enemy when he said no, but it would have ruined him if he had said yes. So. Um, inherent in this story, it's another reason I chose this one for this morning, is a lot of information about how the American Medical Association behaved in general at that time, because it affected a lot of cancer treatments, including Laetrile, um, which also has some promise. So George Henry Simmons took over both the journal and the AMA in 1898. And um, he is the guy who's the architect for the very ambitious strategy to put conventional medicine, what we call that now, in control of all healthcare and to get rid of everything else. And it's the only country in the world, by the way, where this has been done. Alternative treatments are still respected in other countries. Um, wealthy businessmen, uh, we call them drug company executives, recognized that there was a gold mine in medicine, particularly if they could convince doctors to drive all the business to them. So um, he launched this political plan to restructure the AMA, put it in charge of the, nation, uh, the national health care system, and uh, he managed to get all of the medical societies around the country to comply with, with his dream. Within 20 uh, years, most doctors were members of the American Medical Association, and they launched an all-out campaign against quackery. And the definition of quacks is anybody who does something that we don't do. It was very broad. And by the way, at the time that this all started, the average medical doctor in the United States earned less than the average postal worker. And there's a very good book. If you want to read about this whole episode in history, it's called The Social Transformation of American Men uh, Medicine by Paul Starr won the Pulitzer Prize in 1982, if you want to read more about some of this. So the AMA got legislatures to pass laws to restrict or eliminate all alternative practices. Even doctors were speaking out about how aggressive they were. Now, the ironic part about this is Simmons himself was kind of a bad actor. He got his MD from Hahnemann Medical School, which is a homeopathic school. He hadn't graduated from college and didn't have an MD when he started his practice, so he was practicing without a license. He advertised his services in violation of then the AMA code of conduct and, and recognized or promoted himself as a specialist in the diseases of women, which at the time meant he was an abortionist. So he answered charges by claiming the medical school exempted him from the usual requirements because he was so brilliant. But later, very uh, a couple years later, his wife claimed in court that he forced her to undergo multiple abortions by drugging her and he committed her to a mental hospital. So he had to resign from the AMIA and Fishbein, who was a worse character than this, took over. He had learned from the master and continued to consolidate medical power and just uh, they terrorized anybody who was doing anything that was not them. So it's in this environment that Hoxie was trying to promote his formulas. So anyway, after this whole episode with, uh, with trying to buy his formulas is over, uh, they opened a clinic. He and a, a group of people opened a clinic um, in Chicago. And um, eventually Miller and Hoxie returned to Taylorville and uh, the town was very supportive. They wanted to become the center of the world for cancer treatment. An AMA investigator showed up in Taylorville and met with a whole lot of people, including Hoxie. And this was the first ma major hit piece that appeared in the Journal of the American Medical Association. And what they alleged was that Hoxie's father was a quack who dabbled in faith healing. He'd been arrested for blackmailing a dentist. He died of cancer. So how much credibility could he have for these cancer treatments? And 
reported Miller had no private practice and had been operating a ladder business. I mean, it was really a bad hit piece. Denied that the treatment had ever been used in hospitals or reputable institutions, which was patently false. I mean, I, I was able to document uh, that this episode in that Chicago hospital actually happened caused that the claim that the treatment caused people to bleed to death worked for some uh, uh, cancers. They did acknowledge that, but it, there were just much better alternatives available. Hoxie's response, and he was able to document his father had been accused but exonerated of the blackmailing. He didn't die of cancer. The death certificate was easy enough to view. He demanded that Fishbein produce the patients who bled to death, which he couldn't do, and release the records for the patient that he had cured in plain sight in front of dozens of people, which Fishbein refused to do. So Hoxie sued the AMA for $250,000. Clarence Darrow said he might represent him, but he didn't have the money for the case, so he ended up dropping it. And then the state medical board went after him for practicing medicine without a license. And um, of course, working under a licensed medical doctor meant that that was not the case, but um, he was arrested hundreds of times. He was in court dozens of times. And I'll just briefly give you an overview of that here. But um, in any case, um, the, the thing that was very interesting as a continuing theme throughout this is that law enforcement and prosecutors often refused to go after him even after he was arrested or even to arrest him because they were getting his treatments and it was working, right? So there were seven more warrants for his arrest. None went to trial. His siblings sued him for stealing the formulas. He won that, um, you know, but, um, and uh, he finally moved back to Girard where he was from and the citizens there welcomed him. Now they're gonna become the center of cancer treatment for the world. And, um, and this whole campaign with the AMA continued. So Hoxie made a public uh, promise. He said, listen, if you will, um, I will give you the remedies and the formulas if you will make a signed pledge that you will make the um, formulas available to anybody regardless of ability to pay. And of course they wouldn't do that. Um, so uh, more chasing around and, and I'll, I'll, I'll go through this very quickly, but the thing I want you to just focus on as I go through this quickly is that um, Hoxie was determined to do something with, this, with these formulas. And law enforcement and the AMA were intent on making sure that he didn't. So he moved around a lot. So eventually the AMA started actually attacking the citizens of Girard. In other words, they didn't limit their attack to, um, to Hoxie. And I'll come back to this at the end as well. So he ended up moving to Iowa um, and uh, the operator of a clinic there hired him. Um, this guy had a, 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 an organization that was fighting for medical freedom. He also owned a radio station and he promoted the Hoxie treatment on the radio. And within a short period of time, 300 patients a day were showing up at the clinic. So the big story that happened in, in Iowa when he was there is Mandis Johnson arrived at the clinic and the top of his, the entire top of his head was rotting flesh from cancer. He smelled so bad that he couldn't, he had to move out of his house. So Baker announced on the radio that the top of Johnson's skull would be removed with the cancer in public, very similar to what had been done in the Chicago hospital. 32,000 people showed up to watch it. 14 people fainted um, because it was pretty grisly. I did see some pictures of it. Why this is important is it starts to go to so many people saw so much of this, including doctors and that sort of thing, that it just became increasingly difficult to uh, discount what was going on. So this all happened in public. The AMA claimed that Johnson was dead, but he kept showing up alive and that was inconvenient. Then they said he never had cancer, but people saw the removal of the tumor. I mean, it was, it's in, was in plain sight and there are pictures of that available. So fish buying continued and, um, and this goes to, you know, we're experiencing a little bit of this today with censorship. Fish buying went to the FCC to limit Baker's radio broadcast hours to afternoon in the middle of the night to inhibit the ability to promote Hoxie. Their lives were threatened. They were attacked with gunfire and bombs and eventually they got Baker's radio license removed. And, um, and so Baker was sort of an unsavory character, but one of the things that Hoxie said, remember I said his, his kids said he had a tendency to um, have the wrong business partners, but when you're constantly being chased by the AMA and state medical boards, it's hard to get better business partners. So he then moved to Detroit, got an offer from the financier for Henry Ford, practiced under a doctor there. The first day 118 patients showed up. 
The next day, the prosecutor's office <laughs> contacted the doctor and the Wayne County Medical Society started chasing him and the doctor supervising him. The doctor lost his license. Hoxie was arrested. This was the first time he was only convicted two times. And uh, in this particular time, he was convicted of practicing without a license, sentenced to jail. Um, his, um, uh, his financier bailed him out. The Michigan Supreme Court uh, overturned the conviction and exonerated him in 1832. So um, it became increasingly difficult. I think this is what part of the plan, make it so that nobody wants to be around you and it becomes harder and harder to, um, to find someone to cover you in terms of medical license. So Hoxie's comment was, there's only one thing that organized medicine fears more than unorthodoxy and that's free medical treatment. And if you take a look at medical treatment today, oncology today, the treatments go up to $475,000. We have a treatment that costs that now. So Hoxie's treatments for three grand, that would be a bad idea in the view of the orthodox medical establishment. <laughs>